Shalom and welcome back to J Languages. In the last month, I have made two videos, one on three revived languages and one on three language revival movements. However, arguably more important than language revival is language revitalization. That is, trying to save languages from dying in the first place before they even need reviving. Today, we're going to be talking about three languages, all in the Far East, which are doing exactly that. I'll have way more to talk about another time, but for now, let's move on to our first language of the day. So the first language we have is Hawaiian. Now here is the ethnic flag of the Hawaiians. That's not the same as the state flag of Hawaii, but a lot of Hawaiians actually prefer to use this flag. So uh, I'm using that one. And here is a map of the Hawaiian Islands. Now Hawaii is a state in the US, but it has a very non-American culture. Well, at least the indigenous culture of the island. So Hawaiian itself is called Olelo Hawaii, or Olelo Hawaii, depending on pronunciation. It's a Marquesic Polynesian language, which is part of the greater Austronesian languages. It is spoken in the Hawaiian Islands and natively on the Ni'ihau Island, where all the inhabitants speak it as a native language. English is not spoken there. Hawaiian now has 24,000 speakers, however, it was not always this way. As recent as 1991, the language had just under 2,000 speakers. This was before revitalization efforts. The Hawaiian Renaissance, which is represented by the flag of the Kingdom of Hawaii, put upside down to signal distress or national emergency, helped revitalize many aspects of Hawaiian culture, including their clothing, their food, their dancers and their music, but also their language. An institute called the Ahapunana Leo began teaching it in immersive schools in 1983. These were initially private schools, so not many children actually attended. But in the 90s, these started to become public. And now the Ahapunana Leo actually operates uh, across the entire state, and many schools exist, with even non ethnically Hawaiian children going to those schools and studying it as a local language. Duolingo even has a Hawaiian course. This has increased the interest massively, and it's got more than 600,000 learners on Duolingo, increasing interest outside of Hawaii itself. Now here are the actual consonants of Hawaiian, and you'll see that there are not many at all. And here's the vowels. Most of them are a distinction between long and short, but it seems that there are more vowels than there actually are consonants. And Hawaiian is actually characteristically famous for only having 13 letters in its alphabet. And one of them includes the glottal stop, which is called an okina in Hawaiian. Finally, let's take a look at our sample text of Hawaiian, which is, of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What Hawaiian lacks in consonants, it makes up for in prepositions. As you can see, it is not an agglutinative language at all. It makes up lots of different tiny words that are only one, two, or maybe sometimes three letters long to indicate all the different inflections that are necessary. This does not necessarily make it harder, in fact. Some may argue that it makes it easier, as harder would be making it agglutinative. Many people who learn Hawaiian, either from Duolingo, or maybe they've gone to Hawaii and learned some basic Hawaiian, say that it's very fun, very easy, and all in all, a very graceful language to learn. So, why not be a part of the revitalization effort and try it out yourself? But for now, let's move on to our next language on the other side of the Pacific. The mountains in this beautiful backdrop were once home to a widely spoken language known as Ainu. Ainu is spoken now on the island of Hokkaido in northern Japan. They have this really cool ethnic flag, and here is a historic map of the distribution of the Ainu dialects. As you can see, Hokkaido, which is in northern Japan, Kuril, which is a group of islands currently owned jointly by Japan and Russia, you can see there's a line dividing there as the border, and Sakhalin, which is also on a territory owned by Russia, uh, all were home to Ainu populations. In fact, they still are, except they just don't speak the language themselves. And many Ainu people are actually unaware of their ethnicity because it has been suppressed over the centuries. Now, sadly, the story goes that 
long before the Japanese lived in Japan. The Ainu people lived all over the islands, including the main island today. In fact, the largest population of them was the area where Tokyo is now. However, over centuries and centuries, they slowly got pushed out onto the islands of Hokkaido and became unaware of their identity. They were assimilated into Japanese culture. But it wasn't until the age of nationalism that Japan's empire building led them to actively suppress the language and thus the people. They didn't specifically go out and genocide them, but they did assimilate them and suppress their culture from being celebrated, forcing them to abide by Japanese customs and rituals and, of course, Japanese language. However, modern Ainu people are starting to re-celebrate their identity and they are trying to reclaim their language. So let's talk about that now. So the first thing we should pay attention to is the phonology of the language itself. Now we have a basic five vowel system and a fairly simple consonant inventory too. As you may be able to recognize, this is completely different to Jap Japanese phonology and thus would be unsuited to write it with Japanese characters. However, due to Japan's colonialism of the Ainu people, the katakana script is used to write Ainu, although it has had to be modified slightly for certain sounds that don't exist in Japanese and certain sounds that just don't exist in Ainu. The language is called Ainu Itak, at least that's the Ainu spoken on Hokkaido, which is the only surviving Ainu language today, and the one that we are focusing on in this video. It only has five native speakers alive today due to the suppression of this language. However, there are more speakers. It's not all dependent on the native speakers, thankfully. The Ainu identity has been looked down upon historically, as I have mentioned, and this is the main reason for its decline. Not only looked down upon, but actively suppressed by the government. And in recent years, a lot of Ainu oral tradition is finally being recorded by linguists and it is very slowly being retaught to the ethnic Ainu population, mainly in Hokkaido, but some of them also on the so-called mainland of Japan. There are a total of 304 speakers, at least that is listed in 2011. The source is contested and the total number of speakers is unknown. There could be more, there could be less, and we don't know their level. Are they all fluent speakers? or are they just people that have a lot of knowledge but can't necessarily speak at all? Needless to say, that's better than having only five native speakers and the language is on a very small track to being revitalized. On April 19th, 2019, the Japanese government finally recognized Ainu. And this was almost 10 years after they decided to actually finally recognize the Ainu people. Um, Previously, believe it or not, they, they denied, uh, they just said they were Japanese. But they've actually recognized the language now, and hopefully this will lead to the efforts of its revitalization being increased. However, they still refuse to allow it to be taught in schools, so the last thing I just said doesn't seem too likely at all. In Russia, the language has no recognition, and the revival efforts are very small scale by literally just individuals. Some Ainu leaders have called to have some recognition or some preservation of their language. The Russian government has very simply ignored them. So things aren't looking very good for the Ainu people in Russia either. An ethnologue classified Ainu as nearly extinct in 2016. Unless serious efforts are made in the next 20 years, Ainu will go extinct. Normally, we have some quite happy stories on this channel when we talk about languages that have been revived. This is not one of them. This is probably the only sad story we've had so far of a language that will not make it. I do have a sample written in Roman script here, and there is a translation. So you can get a quick idea of what Ainu is like. Again, if you're interested, there are organizations that exist. Maybe you're an ethnic Ainu person who is watching but doesn't know the language, because barely any Ainu people do. There are about 30,000 Ainu people living in Japan and a few more thousand living in Russia. Sadly, many of them don't know their own language. There's also many, many, many more people who are 
ethnically Ainu and don't even know about it because the identity has been suppressed. So if you're watching from Japan at all, there's a possibility that you could be Ainu or have partial Ainu ancestry. Maybe check it out, see what you think. But for now, we're going to talk about our final language of the day. The final language we're going to talk about today is Manchu, represented with this flag, we'll talk about that in a second, and spoken historically in the region of Manchuria. Here is a map of the Tungusic languages of which it's part of. Now we're focusing on the southwestern Tungusic languages, which mainly comprise of Manchu and another language which is often called a dialect of Manchu because it's very, very similar, called Shibe. But first, let's have a historical viewpoint to use as a basis. This is the flag of the Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty of Japan, which ruled between 1614 to 1911. This dynasty, their ruling class was Manchu. Manchurian also is another term that's used. For the first couple of hundred years, the emperors spoke Manchu. Everyone in the court spoke it, all official documents were written in Manchu. And for people who were not Manchu, but worked in government positions or positions of power, they were given financial incentive and praised and paid more based on their level in the Manchu language. This was a policy throughout the 16 and 1700s. However, during the 1800s, standard Mandarin based off the Peking dialect started to take more precedence as it was, you know, an actual Chinese language. And the Manchurian, the Manchurian dynasty, even though it was still the ruling class, wanted to identify itself more with China and not with Manchuria. And after the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1911, it ceased to be a language spoken in all of the country on official documents to just being spoken in the Manchuria region. This was also the same time, or about 20 years after at least, that Japan invaded Manchuria due to the Manchurian crisis, which is a historical crisis I'm not going to go into now. Basically, Japan staged an attack onto a train, used it as a castle spell to go to war, annexed the region, and as Japan tends to do with their colonies, historically speaking, suppress the language and promote only Japanese. That sounds very familiar to what we were just talking about with Ainu. And this has led to the near death of the Manchurian language, along with the Chinese governments that have come to rule back over afterwards, which, let's say, are not too favourable of regionalism. So what is Manchu actually like? Well, as we mentioned, it's a southwestern Tungusic language, and it's very similar to Shibe, we'll get to that very soon. Here is the Manchu script, which is derived from Mongolian. Really cool. It has 20 native speakers. There is an undocumented number of language 2 speakers. It is known to be in the thousands. This is because there are volunteer groups who go around teaching the language in China and lots of localized projects going on. It's hard to keep track of who actually speaks it, who doesn't. But again, the number is known to be in the thousands. So thankfully, it's not as endangered as Ainu is, but still its fall from grace is rather sad. Even the flag we're seeing there is the flag of the Japanese occupied Manchukuo. There are over 10.4 million ethnic Manchurians, which is the crazy thing about this. The <clears throat> government does not support the re revitalization in any way. Is this surprising? And we can look at other regional languages in China and ask ourselves that question. Finally, let's look at this, like, seal, and there's also this bilingual seal in the Forbidden City. So again, you get another look at this script. In fact, I'm going to show you the script some more. It's really cool. Here is some graphs that I got from Ethnolog, which show how it works. It's quite complicated, and in many ways it reminds me of Arabic, because you have isolated initial, medium, and final forms of letters. And some of it's like a, there's a syllabary version as well. These are for just isolated characters and vowels on their own. It gets really quite complicated. They even have their own numerals. This being said, they don't necessarily have a very large complex 
inventory of consonants is fairly normal to most languages. Though as you'll notice they do have aspirated and unaspirated consonants which have different letters which represent them. And let's look at a sample. Here is a beautiful piece of written Manchu and this is what it translates to. Sadly I cannot find a romanization for you. However, don't worry because there is a website which is really really cool. If you're interested in learning some Manchu, I recommend you check it out. It's this, Mini Buleku, a recorded Shibe dictionary. Now I mentioned Shibe and Manchu are very similar. They're basically just dialects of one another uh, and ultimately it associates itself with Manchu under the name Shibe. It's the only website that contains audio recordings of the language and it's a dictionary with lots of different words created by a linguist known as Yaakov Aharon Kodner. He's a really cool guy. Um, you can check him out. He works for jewishlanguages.org and he has his own page as well and he has helped work with lots of different communities including some in Taiwan which speak for most languages and currently Judeo-Iranian and Judeo-Neo-Aramaic so check out him and check out this website. Uh, the link will appear on the screen right now. Yeah, it's amazing. That is all we have time for today. I really do hope that you enjoyed learning about these three different languages. You'd probably heard of Hawaiian before, and you might have heard of the other two but not know much about it. So I hope that you did find something new to actually learn about. And once again, do check out that website and Yaakov Aharon Kodna. Uh, you won't regret it, it's really cool. So thank you for watching once again, please do be kind and subscribe, uh, no pressure though, and I will see you next week, yalla.